It's because our political machine, D.C., is an absolute disaster area. And it's just, it's like, treat like a piece of pork. And these, you know, the defense bills, the reconciliation packages, all these things that the Safe Banking Act has been, you know, put in and pulled out, you know, how more times we can count. This is The Dime. Dive into the cannabis and hemp industry through trends, insights, predictions, and tangents. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Dime. I'm Brian Fields, and with me, as always, is Kellen Finney. And this week, we've got a very special guest, Matt Hawkins, founder of Entourage of Bet Capital. Matt, thanks for taking the time. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you guys doing? Doing well. Kellen, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Excited to talk to Matt. Excited to talk about uh, capital in the cannabis industry. How are you doing, Brian? I'm doing well. Thank you. And uh, before we dive in, a quick housekeeping. A big shout out to Colin Landforce for sharing our cannabinoid playbook. Everyone go check out his newsletter, Free Smoke. And if you want to shout out on our podcast, just share the cannabinoid playbook that can be found on our website. So Matt, before we dive in, can you give a little background about you? Sure. Happy to do it. I've been in private equity for, gosh, 25 years now. All kinds of different things I've done over the years. And 14 is when I got into cannabis. Started doing some real estate lending back then. But then my I call it my luck and timing moment is when I realized that there'd be a bigger opportunity investing in the actual cannabis companies themselves because there's a dearth of capital then as there is now. And that's when we started raising our first fund. Um, now we're refunds into this. And we're, you know, one of the longest standing cannabis investors in the space. So we're, uh, we're very, very fortunate and very happy to be in the space and happy to chat with you guys and answer any questions. Yeah, I can only imagine what you've seen over the years since 2014. So I want to start in those early days. What was it like? And was there any hesitancy to kind of enter in the cannabis industry? Well, there was significant hesitancy because I moved to bed at night thinking there was a chance I could go to jail. So, you know, that's obviously a lot different now. Uh, but back then, that was a concern of mine. And it was also not easy to raise capital because it was our first organized fund, obviously, in the space. And it was uh, not your everyday run-of-the-mill product that we were selling. So, yeah, it was very nerve-wracking for a bunch of reasons. Different ballgame now, though. How much more mature are the companies that you guys are encountering in the space uh, today than they were when you first got into the industry? So I like to say that our firm has kind of matured along with the industry because if you think about it, in our first fund was kind of vintage 14 to 17. And all that was around back then were effectively startups. So we were providing a lot of angel money, you know, pardon the fund, but seed capital. And, you know, $500,000 to a million for investment because that's what these companies needed and that money could move the needle. Fund two was 17 to 19 vintage. and we matured with the industry. We were able to do Series A deals. So usually companies with some revenue, you know, but maybe not much else. But we could write three to five million dollar checks because A, we raised more money in fund two than we did in fund one. It was a, you know, with co-invest almost eighty million dollars. And so that was kind of that was our first, you know, really big fund, so to speak, at least big for cannabis. And now fund three, we've matured even further because we're raising $150 million. We've raised almost half of that. And we're investing in later stage companies and more growth equity because those companies exist. We still do a little bit of a carve out through our partnership uh, with Artview on venture capital for Fund 3, but a smaller percent than we have done historically. When you're writing those checks with operators and and providing that capital for them, is there any sort of understanding of where that capital is going to be deployed or is it up to them to have carte blanche, you know, guidance on what they want to do? No, that's, I think any private equity firm will tell you that use of proceeds is a, is a, you know, a very, very important part of the investment. I mean, you, you need to know that this capital is being used to execute on the business plan that was presented to you by the management team. And any misalignment on that is a is a huge deal. So we absolutely, you know, need to know that and need to be in agreement on it and usually aligned contractually as well. Are there certain things that you've learned through, let's say, Fund 1, that Fund 3 are absolute deal breakers when you're looking for this management team? Or for, for can you give us some examples there? Um, no shortcuts on the underwrites, in particular on management teams. I don't think we took crazy shortcuts. Maybe we did deals because the, the, they just looked too good to be true. But there was something about the management team that just that we didn't feel right about and shouldn't have done those deals. You got to go with your gut on if you don't feel comfortable with the operator or operators. And usually where there's smoke, there's fire. And um, so we just won't ever, won't ever do that uh, going forward. And, you know, we didn't do it very often, but we still, 
you know, learned our lesson. Given the current economic environment that we're participating in, do you think cannabis operators need to be more, you know, uh, strategic with their investments? Or now you think it's the time to growth with the opportunities of new states coming online and the opportunity for big expansion? What, what do you think there? Well, for firms like us, this is a, a great opportunity. I mean, it sucks for the industry. It sucks for the operators because, you know, there's very, very little capital. Valuations are at historic lows. But we've got capital and we can deploy it at very good valuation. So that's a, well, it's good for capital right now. But we don't have an unlimited amount of capital either. Um, and until something happens federally, you're not going to have institutional capital come in and, and we're going to be stuck in the situation going forward, whether the markets are good or bad. So yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an issue. And so with, with the limited capital, how do you guys kind of deploy it from a plant touching perspective versus an ancillary perspective? There's no real percent, but I think our, our goal for Fund 3 is to build scale in as many verticals as we can. So for example, you know, we've, we've made like two single state operator investments that are in Maryland, Curio Wellness and Organic Remedies in Missouri. And both of those companies are now using the growth capital that we provided to expand into other states and to continue their dominance in the states they're in, or the state they're in. So that's a scale building opportunity. We also invested in, another example is uh, Hound Labs, which is the only commercially available THC breathalyzer that kind of measures your THC content in your body at that particular moment. Amazing technology for not only at some point, you know, law enforcement, but impairment's going to be an issue in cannabis, just like it is in alcohol. And so transportation companies, logistics companies, insurance companies that are going to start to get involved there. I mean, that's an opportunity for us to put capital and help this company build scale, become even more of a dominant player. So we just take a look at that and say, okay, where do we want to do this? What vertical track, whether they're plant touching or not? And we go after those. And usually fund three is going to be, you know, five, $20 million of the life of the investment in, in you know, helping these companies execute. With the lack of access to, to capital, what can other operators do if they don't have institutional investors? Where else can they lean to kind of get that extra lifeline in order to kind of help them in their, let's say, day to day? It's not easy. Business friendly uh, commercial lenders. If you've got real estate in your portfolio, that's one way to do it because there's a lot of real estate lenders in space that are all good, reputable companies that aren't going to, they're not doing, you know, loan to own type strategies. But there's not a lot of options. It's equity or real estate. Lenders. Some banks are starting to kind of dip their toe in the water with working capital lines or things like that. But until, you know, say Banking Act is passed, uh, we're going to be stuck there too. The bottom line is that we're operating in the most inefficient capital market scenario that we ever will as an industry. And so that's the good news and the bad news. <laughs> you know, the bad news is we're there. The good news is it's, it's they're not going to be for much longer. Do you think it hurts just the operators? Or do you think it hurts the industry as a whole with the, the limited access to capital? No, the industry as a whole, without a doubt. I mean, it, it's a trickle down effect. Even the larger MSOs have incredibly high cost of capital throughout the balance sheet, and they're not operating as, as efficiently as they could. Yeah, and it, and it kind of continues to trickle down like the supply chain. We've had conversations with operators that said they're waiting for payment from one in order to pay the other. And it just kind of continues down. And, it, and it's, it's one of those where I feel like if you don't recognize the kind of fertiles that are going on, you don't realize how much from a global scale it affects. Kellen, can you kind of expand on some of those issues and some of those conversations we've had where operators have expanded on that? You mean like in California where uh, I think specifically with distribution, it's just challenging, right? Where you have retailers that are looking to place more orders with brands and they just don't have the cash flow to facilitate those those orders. And so how challenging is it as a retailer, Matt? I mean, you guys have um, a couple retailer-focused companies in your portfolio. Could you kind of elaborate on some of the challenges that specifically like Harborside has faced in navigating those problems specifically? Yeah, it's not easy. But let's just stay in California, for example. You have to have scale in order to be successful in California. I mean, the, the dominant players are the ones that have done what we've done at Harborside, which is, you know, execute on a, a creative M&A like we did with the acquisitions of Urban Leaf and Loud Pack and Sublime, or do something like Glass House and Parent Company have done and, and well, to a certain extent, on just building scale within their own verticals. Don't have that much aggregate revenue and scale. You're not going to be able to survive in California. It sucks. So, you know, mom and pop 
uh, dispensaries are going to be sold on the cheap. Those are buying opportunities for the company like it's listed. The other side is so different, but it makes it really, really hard. And the lifting of the cultivation tax is going to help to so make it a whole lot easier on the retailers. So it's a tough road to hoe, but at Harborside, we're excited about the future because, again, back to my point, we're operating in an environment that's only going to get better. And we're going to save a shit ton of money that goes straight to the bottom line on this cultivation tax going away. And that's going to drive profitability for us, which obviously we'll shoot for. How much do you think Harborside's brand has played a role in their survival? I mean, they've been around for a very long time in the, in the California market. And they were kind of the staple for the longest time in Oakland as far as like the premier dispensary and retail location. Um, how much do you think it that's is, played a role in their survival? It's helped a lot. Um, you know, every store we're going to have, it's state house holdings, which is what we're soon to become. Every store will be called Urban League, with the one exception that's the flagship Harborside location in, in Oakland. So yeah, it's an icon, it's a behemoth. But again, it's operating in a very, very turbulent time in a city that is an absolute disaster area. Like in Oakland is an absolute unmitigated disaster. But once again, we're at the bottom and it's got to get start to get better, I think. So we'll see what happens. But luckily, our the brand has absolutely sustained and weathered the storm in a city that's like a war zone. Hypothetically, you're in charge of, of California. What would be the first thing you'd change in order to kind of help the industry, you know, evolve and move forward? You talking about at the at the state level if I was in charge? Yeah, you're at the state level. What would be the first thing you would change? <laughs> well, I would uh, immediately say that we're going to completely uh, redo our tax structure to where we are incentivized as a state to shut down the illicit market in order to generate more revenue that would come in because we're only converting about 40% of the market right now in the state, if that. I think Gavin Newsom has finally come to that understanding that he can only generate more revenue by, by you know, going after the carrot that's just sitting there waiting to be taken, which is the illicit market. But you have to shut it down, or you have to tamp it down. You have to reduce the tax burden on the legalized operators in order to convert users to where the cost is going to be Similar. If you get the costs in a similar range, uh, people are going to go to dispensaries. They're not going to buy it on the street. Look what happened to the pandemic. I mean, during the pandemic, we had a surge and we did have a tamping down of the of, of the illicit market because of that very reason. We had curbside delivery. I mean, how the cannabis industry pioneered social distancing and curbside delivery and pickup. I mean, my God. Um, so it, it, it can happen, but we just need help from the state houses. So California is absolutely a number one. Given the current economic climate, do you think we'll see m a from, let's say, some of the big tier one operators or from a smaller side, do you think they'll be gobbled up by the tier one operators? Are you talking about the large MSOs coming into California? Well, I'm talking about large MSOs kind of grouping up together and, and forming a, a more stronger union versus oh, a big oh, MSO oh, buying, oh. let's say, a smaller tier three operation. I'm not sure I see consolidation in play at the highest level like that. I think there's still going to be, you know, four to seven dominant MSOs that will be gobbling up different states. And at some point, they're going to enter California. You know, that's one of the things we did when we started this process at Armside when we took over the board was I went to all those CEOs. I mean, you know, all those guys. I mean, we were early investors in GTI. I, mean, I know Ben personally. I mean, we know the, know the guys at Cresco Labs. We laughed about how we... You know, our original name was Cresco Capital Partners. And like, how the hell did we just pick the same name here? And so we, you know, I know Charlie. And so we talked to all those guys. We find out, you know, what, what are they looking for? The answer is to a man and to a woman, when they enter the state of California, they, they want there to be a completely vertically integrated operator that's handed to them on a silver platter. And Harborside, now State House Holdings, is that. And we're just going to continue to refine the business, we're going to drive profitability and integrate what we've done. And we're going to be ready to start talking to those guys. But we're you know, not quite there yet, but we're getting damn close. How did you both have the same name? What was the... Was there any sort of overlap? Cresco is, with... Cresco is Latin for grow. And I just Googled it back to 2014. It turns out they did too. <laughs> <laughs> Great minds think alike. Yeah. And then we finally started saying back in, I don't know, 17, 18... We were at an industry event and we were like, it's just, it's ridiculous how many times we're, we're each getting confused with one another. And, you know, they've got a brand. We weren't so, we weren't naive enough. We were tired of being thought of as Cresco Labs, as, uh, you know, private equity. Deal. You know, I think it was flattering for both of us, but at the same time, it wasn't. It's time to go do our own thing. And we've said, look, our brand is our track record. And we've got a good one and we're going to change our name. 
from a retail investor standpoint, is there any sort of words of guidance you can provide for them? There's been some anger and some confusion on Twitter about the current state of the markets. But in my opinion, you know, if you're if you're confident in an operator and investment at a higher valuation, at a lower one, you should feel even better. But given the current status, obviously it's hard to feel that way. What would you say to those people? I would say if you're committed to the industry and you have some money that you want to, you know, put into the capital markets and just deploy it, but stop looking at it. Because the reality is, is that it's going to be this way until something happens legislatively. But when it does, it's going to be, you know, a game changer. And we're not too far off from the safe bank. We're not too far off uh, from hopefully something at the federal level that could be three, five, seven years away. But I mean, we think there's so much value in, in not only the public companies, but even more so in some of these private companies. So we think the best time to be investing in cannabis is right now. Is there a specific portion of the supply chain that you're more interested in as from an investment perspective? No, but I would say that the probably one part of the supply chain that we're, we're not interested in investing in is just uh, cultivation all by itself. It's going to be a commodity in every state at some point, so we don't want to be catching a falling knife. But everything else is, you know, is open for discussion. Do you think there's a portion of the industry that needs uh, more investment in a specific area of the supply chain to kind of help the industry move forward? That's hard to say. I don't think it is. Uh, I don't think one is you know more needy than the other. This is a you know a situation that that is you know perilous throughout every sector of the industry. And to your point earlier about having you know robbing Peter to pay Paul to try to you know buy more product or until there is a working capital availability, it's going to be tricky. But the amazing thing is, is that this is still a $30 billion domestic industry right now. And like we said, 30 to 40% of the market has been converted. So the upside is just absolutely tremendous. And it's only going to get better. Like I said, I, think, I don't think we're far away from the Safe Banking Act passing. And when it does, you know, you've got banks now that are, that are starting to lobby because they want to, they want to do this. And I think, you know, commercially available loans at that point would be not too far behind the passage of that. Favorite under the radar operator you think is poised to explode over the next two to five years? Well, it's clearly in our portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's like asking who my favorite uh, kid is. Come on now. Everyone's got a favorite, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you're not, you're not supposed to admit it, right? <laughs> what cannabis business or opportunity do you think is currently overlooked by eager entrepreneurs that are interested in entering the cannabis industry? Well, look, look at how Labs, for example, they took they looked at a situation that was, you know, going to be a problem down the road that may not be a, a huge problem right now, but will be a tremendous problem you know, sooner rather than later when they address it. I think the vision of looking past where we are now, what needs to happen when things get a little bit more normalized, maybe we don't know what those opportunities are. So having the, the vision to, to you know, create solutions to problems that are either just beginning or about to occur are kind of where the great entrepreneurial minds go to work. What is one concept you have learned that would shock or surprise other individuals operating in the cannabis industry? Well, I'd say what else, I'll put it this way. I think there's a misnomer that there aren't good operators in the industry. And I would say that within the past couple, three years, we've seen a tremendous influx of fantastic operators in the space. Look at Ed Schmaltz, who's the CEO now of, of Harborside slash Statehouse. Ed is a former Goldman Sachs guy. He was... CEO of FAO Short, CEO of Patagonia, then got it. You know, there was a uh, Calix, and he was the CEO of Urban Leaf. I mean, he's got a track record of success both inside and outside the cannabis industry. And so, what's great for investors like us is the industry is now mature enough to where you can underwrite operators based on their success both outside and inside the industry. That's just part of the maturation process of you know, the industry because it's still so nascent, but getting easier to navigate because it's got its sea legs. EEC has been around for almost eight years. What did you get right? And most importantly, what did you get wrong? Well, we got right. What we got right was that this is a real industry and that we've returned a tremendous amount of capital for our investors. Um, and Fund One, Fund Two, and Fund Three aren't far behind. I've built a team I'm proud of. I've got two amazing partners, and it's a joy to go to work every day because our team is really, really special. And probably, see, biggest mistakes. There's too many to even 
Thank you. We, we, the deals we passed on are, are you know, making evaluations for too high and end up selling for three or four X of that. But, you know, there's, and we made decisions on some deals that didn't pan out. But at the end of the day, we're a, you've got 20 plus investments in each fund. And as much as I hate to admit it, you're going to, you're going to make, you're going to have some do sucks. And uh, we're no different than, than any other investor. We want every deal to work out, but that's not the case. Let's do a quick rapid fire. True or false, Texas will legalize cannabis by 2026. Yeah, false. That depends on, well, that's, like, that's actually not true. It depends on if Dan Patrick's in office, who's our lieutenant governor, the answer is it will not. If he's not in office, then potentially we'll at least have a more robust medical program. So is that a true or a false? <laughs> well, I, 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 I gave you the caveat. It's all dependent upon Dan Patrick. What's your, what's your gut tell Texas, you? that he's still going to be there. And it's like, I've always said, that I think it's illegal federally before it's legal in Texas. What under the radar state do you have your eye on? I don't think there's really any under the radar state. I mean, every, every state, we're at a point now where you pretty much know which states are either, you know, have gone or are going. Um, it'd be great if Florida could go wreck sooner than later. But, you know, with the swath of states that have, that have now become adult use on the East Coast, I mean, this is a different ballgame. We're talking about almost two out of three Americans living in a state where there's some type of legalization. I mean, that's huge. And you can see it at the political level because these knuckleheads in Washington realizing that their constituents want this passed. And if we can just stop getting the partisan politics and realize we can all come to the middle and realize those two very simple things. We both want some social reform and we both want there to be you know, commercialization easiness for the industry. Stop putting them both together. Don't make this either or ridiculous and they're just too stuck in their ways and too stuck on their either far right conservative or far left progressivism that they can't seem to get a deal done i think that's starting to change because i think the louder voices in the middle are starting to say hello wake up who's other than just this but this is a very very good example of of a industry that's been used as a pawn and all these you know, political bullshit games that are being played in D.C. And it's just, it's getting louder and louder to the point to where I think we're, we're getting closer than we ever have that. Psychedelics as a medicine, yay or nay? Oh, for sure, yay. Absolutely a, a wonderful medicinal tool. I just think it's an entirely different world than the cannabis world. Favorite product category that you think will explode over the next five years? Well, we're going to see a lot of things change in the banking world. We're going to see a lot of things, uh, you know, payment processing, you know, obviously ease of lending. What causes more disruption in the cannabis industry, interstate commerce or federal legalization? Interstate commerce, 100%. I think the, my personal opinion is that ultimately we're going to see a situation where it's going to be quasi left up to the states and you're going to have states fighting hard for that tax revenue they generate at their, you know, in-house at their state and they're not going to want to give that up. And so that's going to be a really tricky thing to overcome. And I certainly am not smart enough to have the answers on how to do that right away. What year do you think we'll have federal legalization? I think we're, I mean, I can't do any more than just say, I think we're three to seven years away. It's not the best I can do. I just think it's going to be in the whole period of our third fund. <laughs> I like it. Since you've been in the cannabinoid industry, what has been the biggest misconception? That it's a, you know, get rich quick type situation. These are hardworking companies that have, been forced with tremendous headwinds to build their businesses in a industry that is harder to convert than people think. Um, but by the same token, it is something that is, you know, people that have worked hard and will work hard are going to get extremely rewarded because of the size and magnitude and scope of this industry. Before we do predictions, we ask all of our guests, if you can sum up your experience in a main takeaway or lesson learned to pass on to the next generation, what would it be? Probably to go back to what I just said is to roll up your sleeves and work hard, whether it's in cannabis or anything else. But, but this is not a get-rich-quick industry. It takes a lot of you know, blood, sweat, and tears to build companies in this space, just like it does anything else. The good news is you're blessed with a, like I said, a, a, an industry that has already been created for you. You just got to go out there and execute and convert. All right. Prediction time. You already kind of teased it out. Matt, is cannabis being used as a political pawn? If so, why? It absolutely is. And it's because our political machine in DC is an absolute disaster area. And it's just, it's like treat like a piece of pork. And these, you know, the defense bills, the reconciliation packages, all these things that the Safe Banking Act has been, you know, put in and pulled out, you know, how 
it's more times we can count. What is it passed the house six times now? I mean, it's ridiculous. And like I said, it's going to take the voices of the industry. I mean, we're no different. We've been quiet for a while. We're not quiet anymore. We're against the, the Schumer bill because he's trying to do too much at once. He's trying to, you know, pander to the far left with all the social equity bells and whistles. Again, you can do them both at the same time. It's no big deal. But yeah, it's been a 100% political problem. Isn't it a layup though with 70% of Americans interested in cannabis? I mean, is that the easiest thing for, let's say, a politician to kind of grab other horns? I just am shocked that, that people aren't kind of jumping at that. Well, Bill Maher said it best. He said that, that he thinks that the Republicans are going to steal this as an election campaign platform away from the Democrats. And why not? Just for that very reason you just said. At some point, you're going to have to start catering to what your constituents want whether you're Republican or Democrat. And I mean, look what's happening right now with the Roe v. Wade thing. There's so many misconceptions on what the Supreme Court really ruled on. Well, all they ruled on was that it's up to the states. Yep. And the states then have to be the ones to make the decisions. And that's where it's up to us as people to elect the people at the state house that can make those decisions. But what it is, is it's, it's also showing that there is a huge part of both parties' constituencies that want one versus the other. And the, public, and the, the parties are going to have to look at that and realize that they're not speaking to, to, their, to their, their voters. And we're at an inflection point, big time. I also think that's why cannabis is used as a political pawn is because it does have the support from the masses. And so they're just going to continue to use it back and forth to try to push other agendas because they figure if they tag it on to this, it might get some of those people in the middle to support their other agendas. You're exactly right. And it's unfortunate, but it's the reality of the world we live in. Yeah. So how do we get if how do we get out of this political pawn, right? Do we need to put another pawn to replace the cannabis industry? Or like how, how does that kind of evolve so to allow us to move forward? I think we're close. I mean, it's the uh, louder voices in the industry, which is starting to occur. We're a small piece of that, but we're starting to be more vocal in our political beliefs and our political wishes. You've got banks that are wanting to enter the space, so they're starting to uh, lobby for that. And then I think elected officials are starting to listen to their constituencies that are, like you said, you know, sometimes close to 70% Gallup poll wanting this legalized. And two out of three Americans live in the state where, it is, where it's legal in some form or fashion. So it's going to happen. It's just a matter of where. Yeah, and I think as New York's market comes online and New Jersey and the tri-states and maybe Florida gets passes rec, you're going to see the total adjustable market size increase probably maybe even 100%. And when it gets to be that big of a market, I mean, money is going to do its thing and it'll be pushed forward in my opinion. So Matt, for our listeners, they want to get in touch. They want to send you decks for investment. Where can they find you? EECpartners.com. Send me a note at mhawkins at EECpartners.com. Yeah, we're still looking at deals. We're still raising our third fund. Incredibly excited about what we're doing. You know, despite all this talk, I mean, we're, we're incredibly bullish on where the industry is going. You know, all of these are opportunities, not, not really problems. I mean, like we said, we've been operating, you know, in this environment since we started. So it's exciting that we're getting closer to a change. And it's only going to change for the better. Absolutely. Yeah, now is the time to move forward. Thanks so much for taking the time, Matt. Appreciate the conversation. You bet, guys. Take Thank care. You.